Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for a session on algorithmic game theory. Um, we have an excellent batch of papers all about designing mechanisms, signaling schemes, understanding information and data, uh, a, a bunch of really cool papers that uh, are exploring topics that we haven't heard a lot about before. And hopefully you're now refreshed after learning about all different sorts of students that we have in our community to learn about uh, mechanisms and information. So we will start with Gregory. So hi everyone, my name is Grigoris Velegas and today I will present you a new model of selling information. This is joint work with my advisor, Yang Tsai. So as we know, we live in a world that's becoming increasingly more complex. Fortunately for us, there are a lot of data out there that can help us make more informed decisions. So the problem is that these data are not, are not immediately available to the agents who need them. So there have been created markets that sell information. For example, consider a bank that has to decide whether it will approve a customer's loan application or not. Now, the bank might be willing to consult a credit reporting agency such as Equifax in order to get more information about the client. Other examples include navigation under traffic. Now, in this scenario, drivers are willing to use extra information about the current status and Waze is an application that provides such a service. The main topic of this talk will be the seller's problem of finding the revenue optimal way to reveal information. Now, in order to analyze our problem mathematically, we adopt a model that was recently introduced by Bergman et al. In this model, the uncertainty is captured by a set of states of the world. The buyer has to take an action, and based on the action she takes and the underlying state, she receives a payoff. Now, the knowledge that the buyer has is captured by a prior distribution over the states. We call this prior distribution here type. The buyer can choose to get some extra information from the seller and pay some price for it. As in the auction setting, we assume that the type is drawn according to some distribution. Now, the way that the seller reveals information is by sending signals that are correlated with the underlying state of the world. You can think of the signaling schemes that the seller uses as tests. Now, based on the results of the test, the buyer might either choose to deviate to a different action from the one she was thinking of taking or stick to the same one. We call these signaling schemes experiments. In order to come up with the optimal way to reveal information, we first have to consider how the agents evaluate the extra information that they get. Now, suppose that someone has concerns about being exposed to COVID-19 and is given the option to take a test. In this setting, there are two states of the world, either our agent is sick or she is healthy. And the actions that she can take are either to quarantine or go out. Based on the symptoms that she is experiencing, she has figured out the probability of her being sick. We denote this probability by theta, and this is her prior knowledge. Now, the results of the test are correlated with her current state, but they're not 100% accurate. You can think of the first signal as meaning that the result of the test was positive, and the second signal that the test was negative. Now, assume that the test has a 30% false negativity and 30% false neg positivity rate, as in our case. Once the agent receives a signal, she performs a Bayesian update and forms a posterior distribution. We can see here the posterior distributions that the agent forms after she receives one of the two signals. The red line represents her posterior probability of her being sick after she receives signal one as her function of her prior, and similarly for the blue line and signal two. Now, based on the distributions that she has formed, she picks the best action for her. In our example, we see that when she doesn't receive any information and theta is greater than 0.5, she will choose to stay home. If she receives the first signal, she will choose to stay home if her type is greater than 0.3, and if she receives the second signal, she will only stay home if theta is greater than 0.7. In our example, it's also easy to compute the probability that its signal is sent as, the, as a function of, uh, of her type. Now, the value of an experiment is simply her expected payoff after she receives a signal from the experiment 
and she maps it to the best action for her. Now, what I want to emphasize is that different types can map the same signal to a different action. Okay, so let's now see how the valuation looks like for this particular example. We can see that even in our fairly simple setting, the valuation of the agent isn't linear in her type. And this is caused by the fact that different types can interpret the same signal in a different way. So now returning to the general model, we assume that the seller can offer different experiments to different types and price them accordingly. The timeline of the interaction between the seller and the buyer is the following. The first step is for the seller to commit to a collection of experiments and prices, which we call a menu. Once that happens, the state of the world is realized as well as the type of the buyer. Now, based on her type, the buyer selects the experiment she prefers and pays the price for it. As in the auction setting, we assume that, we assume that our buyer is quasi-linear. After that, the seller draws a signal from the predefined distribution and sends it to the buyer. And in her turn, the buyer performs a Bayesian update in the way we described in our example and picks the action that maximizes her expected pay payoff based on the posterior distribution that she has formed. The last step is for the buyer to receive the corresponding payoff based on the state and the action that she took. Now, I want to point out a crucial difference between selling information and selling items. Let's consider the simplest auction setting where the seller wants to sell an item to a single buyer. Now, assume that the seller has fixed the probability that she gives the item to the buyer. Then we can see that the value of the buyer for this lottery is linear in her private type. One thing that we can immediately observe from the previous COVID-19 example is that even in the single dimensional environment, the value of the agent for a fixed experiment is not linear in her type. Because of the fact that different types interpret the same signal in a different way, now the value is a piecewise linear function. And this thing shows that our model is more complex and presents more challenges when we try to derive algorithms and characterization of the optimal menu. For example, Bergman et al. proved that even when there are only two states of the world, the seller needs to use randomization in order to maximize her revenue. Now, I want to quickly present a summary of our results. In the single agent setting, we assume that the tractability of the problem depends heavily on the way that the input is specified. We focus on three different input models. When everything is given explicitly, we prove that the problem can be captured by a polynomial size linear program. We then show that in the case where the input is provided implicitly, but we have access to best response oracle, which takes a distribution over the states and returns the best action with respect to the distribution, we can get an additive f petas as long as the number of states is constant. Finally, in the implicit model where we don't have access to that oracle, we saw that it's be hard to, approx to get a constant factor approximation of the optimal revenue. Now, the original model by Bergman et al. only deals with a single buyer. There are many ways one can extend the model to a multi-agent setting. We propose such an extension, and we saw that the problem is still tractable when the input is provided explicitly. If you're interested to learn more about this extension, please take a look at the longer version of this talk. Thank you very much for your attention. I would be happy to take any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Um, so let's switch over to Brendan and maybe we can take one question during the switch. So Guru, if you could stop sharing your screen. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's uh, buying data now, Brendan. <laughs> Any questions? We will have a panel at the end. So you can save your questions if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So now Brendan will talk about buying data over time. Uh, great, thanks a lot. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, the last talk was about selling data. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about buying data. Uh, this is joint work with Nicola Merlika and Ian Cash. Um, and the, oh, let me see. Da, da, da. Good. Okay, so the starting point um, for this work was thinking about the demand for data, and in particular, um, the fact that we can increasingly think of data as an important input into like a production pipeline. 
Okay, we have tech companies who've been investing in infrastructure where you basically put what data into one end uh, of a production system and like products come out the other end, right? You put in more data, uh, the quality of your products increases. Um, but as the sort of the size of these data sets grow and the costs involved become first order, this raises some questions, right? What actually is the value of adding more data into this pipeline, right? How should I think about it? Um, should I go out and invest in getting 100 billion more data samples or should I hire another data scientist? Okay, do I even need to go out and get more data or can I reuse the data that I collected last month and save some money here, All right? And how should I think about, you know, allocating budget to these data sets versus other reasons? Okay, and, and so this all suggests some design problems sort of underlying the strategies around acquiring data. All right, so I wanna think about a framework where I have some specific use case case for data, right? There's some specific problem I'm trying to solve. I have some cost model where I know like how much it costs to get and maintain my data and some operating constraints. What should my data purchasing strategy be? And in this talk, I wanna focus on the dynamic aspect of that question, which is not just how much data should I buy, but when should I buy it? Okay, how should I think about staleness? Okay, so because I only have eight minutes, let me just dive right into a specific instantiation of this. Um, let's imagine I'm doing a very simple um, estimation problem. Okay, I've got some hidden state of the world, which is a real number. It's evolving over time, right? And I want to think of it as evolving through like Gaussian noise, right? So every round I add some Gaussian noise to my previous state. And I have a decision maker who's trying to estimate this thing. And I want to think of it, they, they choose an action, which is every round they can either guess at the state of the world, in which case they suffer like a squared loss, or they can pass and just suffer a sort of fixed disutility for not guessing, right? So the, the errors here are, un, are not unbounded. Um, but you know, we don't know what the state of the world is, so we can need to learn it through samples. Okay, so this is the data part. Um, what I can do is I can collect some samples um, and each sample is the state of the world plus some noise, which I'm again gonna assume is Gaussian. Okay, and the Gaussianness is gonna be important here. Um, so the way to think about this is more samples are better. If I get more samples, I have a better understanding of what the state of the world is. The value of my guess action is better. Um, and to make this interesting, right, to get at this, this strategy acquiring data, we're gonna assume there's a budget for getting these samples. Okay, so every round I get some budget, right? And I can either spend it right away or I can put it in the bank and save it so I can get more samples later. And so now my design problem is how do I choose adaptively how many samples to actually go out and get every round subject to these budget constraints in order to minimize say my long run expected loss on average over time. Okay, and I'm hiding the, the, the mathematical formulation of what I mean by that expected loss, but it's what you would imagine, right? If I'm doing the optimal decision-making every round, given what I know, I wanna minimize that loss on average, uh, subject to this budget constraint. Okay, so the reason we started with this Gaussian case is because it has sort of this nice property, which is that my expected loss certainly depends on the number of samples I'm getting every round, but for Gaussians, it's actually gonna be independent of those sample realizations. All right, so given some strategy for acquiring data, I can actually think of my loss as sort of traced out over time in this nice way, where as I get more information, as I take more samples, um, guessing gets better. As I take fewer samples, guessing gets worse, right? And so I can imagine the loss I have, so this is loss, okay? So higher is worse. If I'm sort of being lackadaisical about getting samples, then sort of guessing gets worse, and eventually it comes better for me to do the outside option. Then when suddenly I wake up and say, oh, I should get more samples, I collect more. Um, and, and I switch back to guessing again. Okay, so this is the way to think about the outcome of policy. And sort of our first observation is that even in this very simple setup, it's not necessarily optimal to choose a uniform sampling strategy, right? It can actually be better to do something sort of silly like what's written here, where I actually alternate between sampling aggressively and sampling not aggressively. So what is the optimal policy? Um, so what we, we show is that you can get to something asymptotically optimal, by going one step sort of more complicated than uniform sampling, All right? So we call these on-off strategies. And the idea here is to alternate between don't sample at all, just sort of free ride off of the information you've gathered before and save up your budget for some number of rounds, and then switch to sampling at a uniform rate until the budget you saved up is exhausted and alternate back and forth, All right? We call this on-off. Um, and sort of our, our first result is that on-off policies will be asymptotically optimal, right? And asymptotically here because we might need the period to grow large. Um, and the, I'm not gonna be able to get into the proof details, but the motivation here is that, you know, because we have these different uses of data, we can either pass or guess, um, this introduces non-monotonicities in the marginal value for data, 
Um, so it can be, this can push us towards, you know, buying data in batches. Um, and, and this can be, this can, this can be something we can exploit in order to improve our average loss over time. Um, we also consider an extension, right? Where instead of just having a cost per sample, we could also have a fixed cost to collecting any positive number of samples in a round, right? So this would be something like there's, there's some extra cost involved in actually building up the infrastructure to actually go and get samples at all. Um, and what this does is under this sort of policy, uh, under this sort of model, it's not necessarily optimal to take a, you know, a long run of getting a certain number of samples every round. So instead we, we look at this class called lazy policies in which we are maximally free riding off of previous information that we gathered. Okay, so the only rounds in which we ever gather samples are rounds in which we've actually gotten worse than the outside option and like we wouldn't be able to do anything with data at all anymore. Everything's become too stale to be useful. And our result is the approximation result, which is that under this richer model, these lazy policies achieve half of the optimal value. Now, you know, just a word about what, the way we're describing value here, we mean half of the extra value over the default outside option of just passing every round, right? So we wanna think of the extra benefit over passing around as like the value of data. It's what we're getting beyond a world where we got no data at all. And we get at least half of that value through these lazy policies. Um, again, can't say too much about the, the details, but let me just tease a little bit of what's going on. Um, that value we can think of as the area sort of under this orange curve, between the orange curve and the green curve. Remember, green's the outside option. We'll choose the orange curve when it goes below the green. So we can think of this area down here as like the value of our sampling policy. We come up with an upper bound of that policy by sort of, you know, geometrically sort of throwing these, these squares in here. And it turns out that we can think of these lazy policies as some sort of sawtoothy pattern where we're being very extreme and just taking a ton of samples and then free riding off of it. Um, and you know, a triangle is half the area of a square. And so this is where our two approximation comes through. The hard part of this is showing that if this orange curve is feasible with respect to the budgets, then this red curve will be feasible as well. And that turns out to be the case. Okay, so just concluding thoughts, this was a very specific instantiation of this broader framework about trying to understand not just how much data I should buy, but when I should buy it. Even in this very simple case, there's this non monotonicity in the marginal value of data, which sort of leads to interesting solutions um, where we want to collect data in bursts. Uh, there's, I think, a lot of juice left to squeeze out of this orange, right? You can think about applying this in like a lot of different scenarios for uses for data, um, different sort of incentive constraints or supply constraints or whatnot. Um, and there's so, but this all sort of falls within the scope of this broader framework uh, that we started exploring. All right, thank you very much. Cool, thanks, Brendan. Um, let's switch over to Martin, and we can take a question as we switch over. Everybody wants to hold them for the panel. Okay. All right, then we will have Martin talk about algorithmic persuasion with evidence. Also, I wanna do a quick plug and just say, I've watched all of the long talks and they're all amazing. They all have beautiful slides as I'm sure you've seen these slides are very beautiful. So I recommend watching the long talks as well. They talk at a slightly slower pace than they're talking in these eight minute talks. <laughs> so go ahead, Martin. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sorry. Yes, okay, cool. Okay, so uh, this is uh, on algorithmic persuasion with evidence and it's joint work with uh, Passan and Alex. Okay, so what we study in this paper is an elementary game of persuasion. So there's a sender and a receiver. And the difference is the sender has information about the state of the world and the receiver is the one to take an action. So, uh, I mean, naturally the sender wants to exploit his information with advantage and wants to influence the receiver to take an action in her favor. And here we have an elementary case of that. So essentially the sender just wants to persuade the receiver to change the status quo. So for instance, the sender could be an attorney and he wants to con convince a judge to convict the defendant or the sender's maybe a candidate, a job candidate and wants to convince the company to hire her. Now the receiver on the other hand has more pronounced preferences and uh, she wants to make a, or he wants to make a correct decision. So we assume that the state of the world falls into one of two classes, namely acceptable or rejectable. And acceptable is essentially the status quo should be changed. So the defendant is guilty or the candidate is good. So we should hire, or we should, uh, we should convict and uh, rejectable is the opposite. So here we should uh, reject the candidate or, 
or not con convict the descent. Okay, let's make this thing a little bit more uh, formal to see exactly what's going on. So the state of the world is actually drawn from a distribution D. This distribution D is known to both sender and receiver. Now the sender, like I said, wants the receiver to accept no matter what. The receiver on the other hand wants to make a correct decision. So what they do is they did determine a signaling scheme for the sender. So he essentially sees the state of the world and then sends a signal, a message to the receiver and the receiver is an action scheme upon hearing that message, upon hearing that signal, he determines which action to take. Right, so here is the, the information. So the sender actually sees the realization of the state of the world and he knows how the receiver will react. So he then sends a signal. The, the receiver does not know the state of the world, but he knows the distribution and he knows well, how this signal comes into place and then receives the signal, takes an action. Finally, utilities. Well, utility is one for the sender whenever the receiver accepts zero. Otherwise, utility is one for the receiver if he does the correct decision. So it's one for acceptable state and accept action. It's one for rejectable state, reject action, and zero otherwise. Now that's a very elementary game and it's very simple to see what's going on there. And I encourage you to do so. So what makes things interesting in this scenario is the following variant that has been put forward by Glaze and Rubinstein in the Econometrica paper in 2004, and it's persuasion with evidence. And evidence means the signals are not arbitrary. So we have to provide concrete evidence on what's going on in the state of the world. So we have to provide concrete evidence whether the defendant is guilty or whether you're a good candidate, and this evidence could be like grades or papers or things like this. So formally, this model like this, so you have this, this state evidence or state signal graph where here is the states of the world and they are acceptable or rejectable like green and white. And there's this prior over the state of the world. And then there is this known state signal graph, which means in which state of the world can I put forward which evidence, which collection of evidence. So that's the input to the problem. Now the sender determines the signaling scheme could be something like this. So here it's almost deterministic. In these two states, he sends this signal. In this state, he sends this signal. Here he actually randomizes 50-50 between these two signals. Okay. Now the receiver sees this and says, well, I mean, if I get this leftmost signal here, then, well, I mean, I get it 30% of the time. And then like 20%, it's a rejectable state. 10% is an acceptable state. So my best response here would be to reject. And so you can do this Bayesian update for each of the signals and then turns out these are the best response actions of the receiver. Okay, good. Now seeing this, of course, the sender says, well, you know, I want to maximize the probability that the state of the world is changed. So the accept action is played. So I want to route as much probability here to this accept signal. So I want to send this as often as possible. So for instance, so for, uh, in this case, the sender would actually change to that. And now you can sort of play this again and see this is actually an equilibrium. So here the sender best responds to the action scheme of the receiver and the receiver best responds to the signaling scheme of the sender. It's not the only equilibrium here in this case. I encourage you to look at this. So there's other equilibria, but this is one of the problems we study here. Uh, so compute such an equilibrium, right? So can we find an equilibrium like that, right? Constraint equilibrium, find a sequential equilibrium. Then we also study two scenarios with commitment power. Commitment power means that um, you actually have one agent who commits to a certain behavior and then pulls, goes through with it and anticipates the response of the other. So it's not necessarily an equilibrium, but it's more like a bi-level optimization problem. So the sender says, okay, this is the way I signal, anticipating the best response of the receiver, trying to maximize its utility. Same thing could be for the receiver. He says, well, this is the actions I'm going to take. I'm going to anticipate what the sender is send, sending me in terms of information and signals. And I'm picking this action scheme to maximize the results we take. Now it's heavily debated in economics whether these commitment power assumptions are actually realistic. And we don't want to join into this debate. Uh, here we just uh, study both of these scenarios from a computational perspective. Well, if you think about the motivation, maybe if you're a big company, then maybe you have commitment power and you say, okay, these are the concrete evidence I want to see unless I won't hire you, right? So this may be a scenario where the commitment power is with the receiver. So that would be the delegation case here. 
you could also maybe envision scenarios with the commitment powers with the sender. But as I said, I mean, in terms of interpretation, it's up to debate. Anyway, so what are the results? Uh, so one of the first results is the equilibrium problem can be solved in polynomial time. So I don't want to go deeply into this. The main message is it's a max flow based construction based on which we can compute the equilibrium. Uh, full disclosure, though, these equilibria can be quite bad in comparison to the commitment power solutions. If you have commitment power, there are scenarios where the commitment power agent can significantly improve its utility. So we also study these commitment power uh, variants, and turns out they're actually quite hard. So there is a, um, a trivial or a very simple O of n approximation algorithm for the persuasion case. There's a simple two approximation for the delegation case. And these are essentially also hard. So we have an n to the one minus epsilon hardness for any constant epsilon that's uh, max independent set hardness. And we also have a two minus epsilon hardness for the delegation for any constant epsilon. So even though this seems to like a very elementary game, like these persuasion and delegation scenarios can be very hard and actually hard up to trivial algorithms to approximate. So that's why we thought, okay, what about special structure? What about more structured instances? What about things like I have a unique acceptable state, I have a unique rejectable state. Every state has only two possible signals. Every state has only the possible signals, things like this. And we went through with this and we found different algorithms. Right? So there's a variety of algorithmic techniques that we use in these, these uh, in these scenarios, maybe the most interesting one is this degree two states where we have a semi-definite programming based approximation algorithm who gives us a 1.1 approximation, but there's also like integer programming rounding here. And there is a, a PTAS here uh, based on, uh, on the enumeration. So I guess the general message is that the persuasion scenarios are generally much harder than the delegation scenarios. Um, but also delegation is hard and we actually need special structure here in this, uh, in, this, in this domain. And of course, there's many open problems here. So like extend the, the elementary scenario to more general utilities or think of other meaningful scenarios where you can do good approximation or even polynomial time algorithms, things like this. And uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, and let's save questions for the panel. So our fourth speaker is a total surprise. Uh, guest, guest speaker, uh, we'll have Brendan again. Um, and he will be speaking about a paper so nice that has quasi-linear in the title twice. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, and hello, everyone again. Uh, can you hear me again now? Fantastic. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so uh, good. This is joint work uh, with Moshe Babaya, Richard Cole, Jason Hartline, Nicola Merlika. Um, and so this is a paper about auctions and mechanisms. Um, so I'm going to start with just a, a very quick, you know, some background by looking at an extremely standard sort of uh, auction design type of question. Okay, so I want to imagine I have an allocation problem. Um, I have some goods in apple to banana. I want to allocate them to some users, you know, pink and purple. Um, the users have value for the goods and values for combinations of the goods. Let's imagine those values are come together additively, right? And my goal as a designer is to come up with some way to partition the goods amongst the buyers um, to maximize some objective. And for now, let's say it's total value. Okay, so completely trivial optimization problem. I'll the game theory session. Uh, so the issue here is strategic behavior. Very standard way to solve this is to introduce payments. Okay, so what we can do is we can assume that the users say have quasi-linear utilities, which is to mean that we can measure their values in dollars and then assume that they relate the value of what they get with uh, what they have to pay through a linear function uh, like this down here. Um, now, the title of the talk should give a hint that we're gonna revisit this quasi-linearity here, but for now, let's just go with it. Okay, so if we assume this quasi-linearity, then there's you know, very strong uh, solutions to this type of problem. We have like the VCG mechanism, which in this case just says, give every good to whoever bid the most on it, and they pay the second highest bid on that item. Um, under this mechanism and these payments, um, everyone will declare their values truthfully, we get the maximized, maximal value. Okay, beautiful theory, very rich. Um, there's a lot of work in Econ CS that applies this to a bunch of different allocation problems and algorithms to try to understand um, you know, how to get people to behave truthfully. 
Um, but the thing we want to go after here is that uh, this relies very crucially on this quasi-linearity assumption. And this quasi-linearity is not uncontroversial, you know, in economics more broadly. Okay. So, you know, this tends to be a, you know, a standard way to model people when, when you have like small stakes payments, but once payments get large, um, this is perhaps a, a little questionable. Okay. A more robust and general model is to assume that people have a disutility for payments that's not necessarily linear, right? In particular, say it's convex in the amount of money that's being spent, right? So the way we think about this is that people have a value for goods in utility, and they have a disutility for payments also measured in utility. And let me spend a minute motivating this convexity here. Convexity captures the fact that each dollar that you spend is a little more painful, a little more costly than the last, okay? And so why is that reasonable? It captures a bunch of different things. Like for example, um, the users might have budgets. They might not have an infinite amount of money available to spend, which means that when they spend money on your mechanism, they're taking that money away from some other use for it. Okay, so the value of spending an extra dollar here is not a dollar. It's what they would have spent that dollar on if they weren't spending on apples and bananas. Okay, and they would pick up, take money away from less valuable things first and then more valuable things as you force them to pay more and more. And that gives you this convexity. Um, it also captures things like risk aversion and so on. A lot of different uh, utility sort of models captured here. Okay, great. So suppose that we, you know, believe that, you know, more generally agents might have these convex disutility for payments. So now there's a, a robustness question here. Okay, so we've developed this rich theory sort of to building these like best practices and mechanisms, you know, for quasi-linear agents. What would happen if we take these things and deploy them in these richer environments where people might not be quasi-linear, okay? Have we been giving bad advice to these tech companies who are using this theory to sell ads and so on? Um, and I wanna emphasize that this is a robustness type question, okay? So these, you know, disutility curves, we're thinking of them as being completely unknown and the mechanism is agnostic to them, right? We have a mechanism designed for quasi-linear environments, right? And so I wanna compare this to a, like a beautiful line of literature where we're looking at designing mechanisms for specific utility models that are non-linear. Okay, that's not what we're doing here. We're saying if I take a mechanism that's truthful if agents are quasi-linear and dump it in this richer environment, what happens? Well, what happens? Um, so certainly the, we lose truthfulness. Okay, the mechanisms aren't even direct revelation anymore. Okay, the agents aren't expressing their utilities to us. Um, but our, our sort of our first and main result is that um, at the equilibrium behavior, there's some nice structure that pops up. Okay, so for a general class of social choice problems, right, much more general than this additive case I started with, um, at equilibrium, the agents will have best responses where they take their valuation functions and scale them by uniform factors. Okay, so people will take their valuation functions and they might not report them truthfully, but they'll scale them down by some uniform factor, right? So in particular, in this additive case, in general, an agent could declare like an arbitrary bid for every good but they always have a best response where they take their bids for the different goods and sort of reduce them down by some uniform factor. And in fact, this factor is interpretable. Um, these scalars, we can think of them as corresponding to the return on investment that the agents get at the equilibrium that's re that results when we run the mechanism. Um, we can also ask about the properties of these equilibria. Okay, there could be more than one, um, but here we give a price of anarchy style result. If we focus in on that additive case, right, that I started with, and we think of running this VCG mechanism, what we show is that every equilibrium of this form gets us at least half of an appropriate notion of the optimal welfare. And we have to be careful here about how we define welfare because we've gone outside of the realm of quasi-linear utilities. And so it's not even obvious how you should aggregate up the utilities of, of all the different agents. Um, I'm gonna say more about that in a moment. Okay, so let me spend the rest of my time just taking those results and stating them a little more formally. Um, for this equilibrium scenario, what we're saying is take any mechanism that would be truthful if the agents were quasi-linear and take any value functions for the agents and these, you know, cost of money, these like disutility curves that are convex. Then for every agent, no matter how the other agents are bidding, there's always a best response for them in which they take their value function and scale it by this factor. Moreover, there always exists a pure Nash equilibrium in which all the agents are behaving in this way. Okay. Um, some notes about this, okay, so this holds for a reasonably general class of social choice problems. Really, the, the main condition we need is convexity of the outcome space, which we can think of as saying it's, it's the mechanism is able to randomize. Um, but, you know, outside from that, it's actually quite general. 
Um, the other thing I want to point out is that there's a lot of delicacy here around tiebreaking that I'm completely sweeping under the carpet here. Like if we're saying that there exists a pure Nash equilibrium, that should raise some red flags, like, oh, you know, doesn't tiebreaking come into this? And it does. Um, and so more formally, what I'm saying is that there is a way to sort of do, define your tiebreaking rules so that a pure Nash equilibrium exists. Um, but please see the paper for more details about that. Um, now for this price of anarchy result, um, I want to say more about the way we would define welfare here. Um, so we'd like to say something like these equilibria that we come up with are approximately efficient. Um, but we need to be careful, like in particular, something that we can do um, is we could take one buyer and blow up their utilities for outcomes by a factor of a million and also blow up their disutility for payments by a factor of a million. That would not affect their strategic behavior at all. They'd be completely equivalent from a mechanism's perspective, but their utilities are completely out of scale. So it's, it's difficult to sort of aggregate these up. And so what we do is we define what we call transferable welfare which sort of leans into this idea that we should define welfare in this common uh, uh, units, which we call money, All right? So we'll say that the agent's willingness to pay for an outcome is how much they'd be willing to pay to get that outcome as opposed to getting nothing. Okay, so we can read this off of this curve here, like for a given outcome, we can draw, you know, here's the value you'd get in utility and look at the intersection with the curve. This is how much they'd be willing to pay. And then transferable welfare is the sum of this value over all the different agents. So you can think of this as how much would the pool of agents be willing to pay in aggregate in order for this mechanism, like to, to fund this mechanism, like how much would they be willing to pay? And I want to note that this generalizes the standard notion of welfare for quasi-linear agents. It also generalizes the notion of liquid welfare for budgeted agents, right, which is the minimum of the value and the budget. Um, and so it's taking those, those notions and extending them to these general curves. Um, good. And so under that notion of welfare, we get this price of anarchy result um, at any equilibrium of this form um, for these mechanisms, we get half of the optimal transferable welfare. Uh, and that's, I want to clarify, this is specifically for this additive case. Okay, so to summarize, mechanisms type of quasi-linear agents, dump them in this environment where agents are not necessarily quasi-linear. Um, what happens? We get this type of equilibrium where agents just scale by these constant factors. Um, there are some notions in which the outcomes are approximately efficient. Future directions, um, you know, extending the, the analysis to more general classes, but also things like these are all existence results. We'd like to understand things about computation as well. Great. Thanks very much. Cool. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all the speakers. It was a great session. Um, so now we are going to go into the panel part. I have prepared a bunch of questions, but I'm also happy to take questions from anyone. And also as we move into the panel, I'm happy to have any of the authors discuss. So I think you're all already panelists. If you're here, if any of you are attendees and you wanna raise your hand so you can be promoted, that's fine too. Um, cool, so if you have a question you wanna ask the authors, feel free. We can also, if anybody has individual questions, there's a virtual coffee break on Gather at 1230. Hopefully some of the authors will be around to chat one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so if nobody has a question right now, then I will start off with my questions. Okay, great. Um, so a lot of, I think all of these papers really surround uncertainty, like much of mechanism design. And so I guess the question is, what, what's the crux of uncertainty and the problems that you're working on? How is it defining your problem, making it more challenging or making the outcomes better in some cases? What do you think the, the crux of uncertainty in, in your problem is? Anyone? Uh, sure. Okay, let me take a crack at that for the talk I just gave, the one about non quasilinearity. And I think there, the really the uncertainty here is around, you can think of it as like the, the broader context outside of the mechanism that we're designing. Like part of the idea is that, you know, the way that the agents are going to respond depends a lot on, you know, what options are available for them for money sort of outside of this space. And so somehow there's this sense in which um, there might be uncertainty there. It's just inherent. Like we, we, it can't, we, we can't expect to be able to actually extract all of that information from the users in some reasonable mechanism. And so somehow we need to come up with the right set of knobs to expose to actually get people to behave in a reasonable way and sort of like have this, you know, user in the loop almost sort of scenario where the users won't be able to tell us information directly, but somehow interact with what we expose to them. Can I um, comment on that too? I think um, 
a crucial a thing with this uncertainty uh, that you mentioned is, and especially with regard to mechanism design, where the prominent approach is to look at truthful mechanisms. And in truthful mechanisms, all of the uncertainty that comes from the agents knowing stuff has to be reported to the designer uh, in a direct report, direct revelation, truthful mechanism. And that just doesn't seem to be a great sort of balance between like, you know, where the sort of hard work is happening. And, you know, what this, this paper that Brendan just uh, presented is tr trying to get around says that actually, you know, simple mechanisms that don't try to, you know, have a message space that's as complicated as the agent's actual, uh, you know, valuation space. Um, actually, you know, have good equilibria. And then you, you let the agents do a little bit of a calculation. It turns out it's a single dimensional calculation for all of them. How much, like what's the multiple factor to shade? And that's actually still pretty easy compared to like, it's, it's, not, it's not like a high dimensional optimization they have to do, a high dimensional, you know, non-convex optimization they would have to do. It's actually to find this equilibrium, it's a single dimensional optimization for each agent, um, which seems like it's, you know, well within the realm of reasonable. And, you know, I just think that this is where we're going to be with real mechanisms always. We're never going to be having, we're always going to be sort of in a misspecified model where, you know, there's additional stuff in the agent's cost function that we haven't modeled in our mechanism design. So the mechanism's never going to be truthful. And the question is, is do these truthful mechanisms, you know, are they robust? Do they degrade nicely with this or not? And um, and I think that getting at your question, Kira, I think this is just a, a phenomenal, you know, area. And I think that, you know, we have to embrace this area, and we haven't really done such a good job of that yet. Um, and, uh, you know, actually, um, there's a cool connection here to distributed systems that I like a lot, which is sort of the end-to-end -end principle that says. Or, and there's also like this idea of like, you know, do the computation where the data is, right? Which says that if someone's got complicated, you know, constraints, they should do the, the computation around optimizing their constraints for something. Not, they shouldn't just like ship all their constraints to some central planner to do it. Um, that's gonna create, you know, very complicated, not robust mechanisms versus the sort of, you know, let people sort of optimize for themselves. So I think that this is sort of a super important direction for us and I just like, you know, we have to work in this area and we haven't done enough of it. I could discuss that for a long time, but I want to give the other authors a chance to talk about their paper. So the, the question was about uncertainty in your paper. Yeah, I see that Rat has a hand up. I just wanted to let the other authors respond before we move to the next question. If they want to, we don't have to. Okay, uh, Rod, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think that's a question for Brandon uh, about the last talk, the first half of the last talk. Uh, so how do you define welfare in, in that problem? Is it just going to be the sum of the utilities of the buyers plus the sum of the payments? Um, Sorry, in the, so for the, the transferable welfare definition? Right, yeah, so just, uh, yeah so, so basically if I want to think about the welfare when you have these additive, uh, additive utilities, but the yeah. convex functions are changing the payments, um, so what's the, what's the welfare? Is it just like the sum of the values or is it the sum of the values minus the sum of the convex functions at the payments plus the sum of the payments? Yeah, okay, so there, there are, good. So there are a bunch of, there are many reasonable ways you could imagine defining it. Um, right. The way that we take is this transferable welfare notion. So we basically say, we wanna define the value being generated basically in dollars. So we literally just say for every agent, how much would you be willing to pay for your outcome? 
and we actually define that this is the no, this is the quantity that we're trying to maximize. And so we say we get a half approximation, like that's the quantity we get. Okay, now for the second half, right? Also in the first half, you I guess you didn't care about welfare. You just wanted no. To so this was this was just so that was just saying like what is the nature like what do the equilibria look like? But in general, we weren't trying to you know argue about the welfare properties. Now you could apply you could ask the same question sort of more generally, and I think there are open questions there that are really interesting. And and then one other clarifying question. So uh, I can still implement externality payments after applying the inverse of the convex function, right? So there is another true, so, so rather than the non-truthful mechanism that you analyze at equilibrium, there is also a truthful mechanism here because we essentially have a quasi linear agent in disguise, right? So I can just like find externality payments and apply the inverse of the convex function or am I missing? Absolutely. So Good. So if you knew what those curves were, then you could generate in payments that would cause things to be truthful. Correct. Absolutely. And I think that there are, there are you know, for, for any for particular, you know, way like classes of these curves, you could set up what those payments would be. And there's like a lot of work that sort of goes into like this class for that versus that class. And so I'd say that's sort of an orthogonal direction to so what we're looking for here is if we don't know the curves at all, so we can't implement that solution what happens as a result of not being able to do truthful payments. And, and is that- Sorry, why that is that true, Brendan? It's not quasi-linear. Hmm? No, I mean, it is, it is still additive, Jason, so you can just do a change it's of variable. It's not quasi-linear. You'd have to have a linear payment to add to that, which is not in the payments function. Then how do you do that? Well, I calculate the external payments using the values. Then it I it's separable. It's separable. I just then I just use let's call pi tilde to be ci of pi. So pi. Oh, I see. You're going to invert the payment function to make someone's pain be right. what it should be in the quasi-linear yes. case. Yes. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I think Got there's it. a question in the chat for Brendan from Simon, and then Grant has a question after that. So the question from Simon is. Uh, about the con the convexity assumption on the disutility. And is there a world where it could be concave? How crucial is the convexity assumption? Uh, I would say the convexity assumption is crucial to the results. Um, now, whether there are other environments that go beyond convexity, sure. I mean, absolutely. And you might imagine that, you know, but um, yeah. So, for example, like if someone is like risk loving or something like this, you could imagine some sort of model. Um, I would say that that's less standard than the convex model, but I think exploring environments where like what would go on with certain ways of going beyond convexity would be a reasonable thing to think about. Uh, Grant? I have a question that just a prompt for discussion. So I would say there's some papers here about buying and selling of debt, even the uncertainty. There seems a huge between uh, theory and practice and buying and selling of data. Um, and uh, so the question is, and you know, maybe Jason provided a, a, a good answer to this, but I'm sure there are more. Um, what are issues that are kind of dividing either, what are the issues that are dividing the theory from the practice and how could we make our theory um, a little closer? What are the deep philosophical questions that our theory is trying to answer? If it's just, there, there's value apart from practice, but then in that case, what are the big questions that we're trying to answer? I mean, okay, so maybe a little bit of a, of, a, of a pithy answer, but like the, so one certainly division between the theory and the practice here is that a lot of the theory is sort of saying, you know, let's look ahead to a model, to a world where there is like a robust market and then try to think about now, like, how would I think about it? But, you know, in practice, there are a lot of frictions in order to actually building a market like that and having it be robust. Um, and I think one of those frictions is the fact that, you know, the value of data is quite context dependent, right? So like how valuable is, you know, a bunch of 
samples from some data source. Well, it's difficult perhaps to, to sort of argue about that in a, in a very general sort of sense, um, since different, it's really gonna depend on the particular usage. And so I think that one thing that I feel like a lot of the literature sort of, you know, start, starting to go in on is, is really focus on particular ways of using data to sort of try to at least get a starting point, like get a foothold on, you know, I can't really talk about the value of data, but maybe I can talk about the value of samples to a data analyst who's doing regression. Um, and having one, one barrier to practical systems is to be able to have some kind of marketplace where perhaps people with a lot of different use cases in mind can all sort of interact simultaneously with the same, same thing where evaluations are very different. Um, and so I think that's been a sort of a difficult thing um, for practitioners and theory folks to sort of simultaneously get their hands on. So I just want to supply Jason's answer. Thank you. Like Jason's answer is one, one thing is that we've, we, the theory has been focusing on these revelation mechanisms and in reality, we want robust, simple mechanisms and that, that would probably uh, work a lot better in practice. If there's any other thoughts out there. Because I mean, I, I love this area and I, I love the papers here and I've written papers on it. But I, I, I wonder how to get from where we are to where we want to go. I think the, um, the simple versus optimal paradigm is going to be super valuable here. Uh, and the reason why is that, you know, if you try to do statistics, the optimal like experiment to run, if you've got a complicated statistical question, like, you know, do, getting like nice understanding of that object that comes back is like really like, you know, our theory can't do it. Um, and, you know, maybe you could do it algorithmically, uh, but, I'm not sure what that would look like. And so um, I think that that's a big sort of blocker here. Uh, you know, I, with Shuti Chawla and Dennis, I had a, a couple papers in EC 14 and 16 about trying to like design mechanisms to get good data, right? And it was just like super hard to sort of characterize what good mechanisms would look like because the statistics is so messy. So you're, you're not going to get something that says this is optimal because this is, is messy. And so how do you deal with the fact that the statistical value is, you know, fundamentally like you, you want to minimize your error, right? With, with respect to something. And so, you know, those bounds are so loose typically that what do you do? Yeah, I mean, so just a, just an anecdote building on that. So like many, some, I don't know, eight, nine years ago at some point, I, I, I was speaking with some people inside Microsoft from the Sigma community, like the database community. And they were really struggling with this question of like, how should I price database queries, right? So I have a user who wants to make a query against the database, like how should I price it? And they want to say things like, well, if it's data that they'd already gotten previously, maybe they should pay less or something like this and actually trying to get at the information value of different queries. And it was just a, a bunch of people had sort of taken shots at this and then completely given up. And so somehow like, yeah, so just to echo Jason's point, I think that like actually trying to get at like valuing these things, you know, ourselves as sort of the, the seller is maybe like less promising than saying like, I'm going to have some class of like pricing schemes or something like this, and then let sort of the demand side of the market work out how valuable things are from them. And then hope that something like, you know, market equilibrium pricing or something like somehow takes over and drives and that like there's some simple class of things where we can learn from people's behavior what should be more expensive than what um, without having to like centrally, like in a central way, like derive everything ourselves, which just feels like a non-starter. Yeah, I guess one thing about that solution that always, um, like I, I'm not entirely sure where, how, where I fall along these lines is in some sense we are pushing the complexity onto the agents in the setting as opposed to absorbing them as the mechanism designer. And so I think that's great, but I think it should come along with 
a different model of behavior. I think we're a bit too tied to rationality assumptions, like Bayesian rationality assumptions, especially if we want to start pushing other um, complexities into the, the agent's uh, like you know domain, and we would be well. Uh, served by looking into the behavioral economics literature and trying to leverage some of those models. Is it to, uh, to, to Brendan's right. point, like maybe we're currently already doing some of this, which is a few people value the data a lot, namely advertisers, and they extract it and collect it and keep it to themselves and use it. And it's basically not available to anyone else who has less value for it like social science researchers or things like that. Can I sort of follow up on what Nicole said and ask a question, which is, um, do, do researchers overall think that like hyper rationality assumptions are fairly practical? Like when you're selling an advertisement, are you selling that to a, a person? Is a person gonna click or like, is the company gonna have some algorithms that they've fine tuned and their data scientists are like pretty sure this is their exact value for things. Um, like one of those sides does seem like behavioral economics is gonna be a crucial thing. And the other one I've always had in my head as like the fit for quasi linear utilities. Um, which Isn't of our right many thing? researchers who have worked or work in industry would like to jump in? <laughs> Not sure if we have. Brendan. <laughs> I'm sorry, quasi behavioral versus quasi linear are two orthogonal questions. Uh, so I'm not sure. You, you ended with quasi linear, but you started with behavioral. So I'm not sure what the I question is. I think you meant behavioral flip, flip versus sorry. Asian rationality with priors and updating and stuff. The, my ex favorite example here is the Dutch flower auctions. And the point is, is that these auction buyers go in every single day and they're people, not algorithms. But if they were bad, they would get fired. So they better be rational. So I don't think it's <laughs> algorithms versus people. I think it's repeated versus not repeated. Okay. Um, that's a big difference. Uh, and a lot of the behavioral game theory looks at first round behavior for exactly this reason. Because it's just quite a different beast uh, to look at first round behavior from mm -hmm. repeated behavior. Um, and by yeah, the way, I love the recent work uh, that our community is doing on repeated behavior and like using regret as the bound instead of uh, the notion instead of truthfulness. Like I, I think that's, that's amazing work. Like this is really um, huge contribution. Yeah, I guess along those lines, like from the industry perspective, we do a lot of um, like these bidding automated bidding agents are often doing things like learning, doing no regret learning style algorithms in the background. So trying to fit them to worlds in which there's priors and there's updating and they're playing some repeated game and they, you want to find a PBE, like I think is pretty unrealistic. And also in terms of the, um, behavioral being appropriate for games we play once. Like one of application where I like to think about behavioral agents is uh, school choice markets, for example. That's why I do a bunch of work in the matching literature. And there, I imagine parents are not really playing a repeated game. Are they rational or very unrational almost? Like, cause it is high stakes, so maybe well, I'm not a parent, <laughs> but <laughs> I've worked with this on Brendan and I think he has opinions. I mean, I, I think that like, like this is a place where like the repeated version, but also like things like evolutionary stability and things sort of make sense. Like I, I wouldn't necessarily say that a certain solution concept is predictive because it's an equilibrium when everyone's hyper rational. But, you know, if I have a solution where there's some deviation that people could make to sort of improve their, their outcomes, then I would say that, that that place that we're starting from is probably not predictive, at least in the long run, right? We sort of expect that if there's some deviation that people could make and benefit from it, eventually they'll figure it out, right? And someone will make a blog post and then suddenly everyone will just like switch doing this other thing, even if they don't completely understand why. 
right? So, you know, yeah, the, when, when we were thinking about like parents and, and playing these mechanisms for like school choice and such, it was, it was amazing how important like the playground conversations were to like what people actually did, right? So there was a lot of just people discussing with each other without even fully understanding like, oh, you should, oh, piss, piss, you know, piss, you should do this thing and then you'll end up with a better outcome and so on like this. But I think it's very um, hard. In school let me, let me, let me interject for a second and just say that the other session is going to be starting in room A uh, on algorithms chaired by Sam Hopkins. You're welcome to go to the other session uh, because we have two rooms. We can stay here and continue this awesome discussion as long as we want. I will be staying here. So if you want to go to the other session, feel free. If you need to drop off, feel free and we can continue now. Um, I, just, I was just saying, like in school choice, as an and up the, like continuing that example, it's very hard to convince people to list their uh, true preference ordering, even if you're running deferred acceptance. Like parents think, oh, this school is hard to get into, so I should shouldn't like risk my second choice, uh, even though it's not like you know it. It's hard to prove that, right? And I guess. That's maybe what Sheng Wu is trying to talk about in obvious strategy proofness. And so we need to think about other mechanisms in that world, is my opinion. Yeah, and I think of Vinatan has all those papers about as well with ex experiments. There's a, there's a big dichotomy in uh, like mechanism design versus say market design. And one of the big differences is market design is typically focusing on the one shot games where things like obviously strategy proofness and truthfulness are super important because of this potential behavioral element. Whereas much of the mechanism design literature, uh, you know, that would have a Bayesian prior, for example, um, is much more relevant in the repeated scenario where actually the rationalities or at least, you know, uh, no regret for repeated whatever is, 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 you know, a reasonable assumption. And so, and if you look across these two literatures, the methods and techniques are just entirely different and for good reason. The point is, is that like, there's one thing that you want to just one way to design things for single round and you either need to be behavioral or you need to be obviously strategy proof or something. And there's another way to design things for repeated interactions, which does not need that. Uh, and uh, is, you know, most of what we call mechanism design. Yeah, I had other questions prepared. I don't know if you want me to throw them out there, but. Yeah. Um, well, so for instance, a lot of these papers actually had a lot to do with like temporal aspects and repeated actions. And for example, is Martin still here? Yeah, Martin's still here. Um, like, like his paper had a lot to do about whether you were able to commit or not. Uh, Brendan et al's, uh, the first paper that Brendan talked about had to do was that the first paper? Yeah, um, had to do about, you know, this problem of buying data, data over time and whether it's still or not. Um, Gre Gregoris's paper, uh, I know, is like in the single shot case and it's a completely different problem if you allow there to be multiple interactions. In the single shot case, you are able to sort of import all of these solutions that we know from, for example, revenue maximization. And in the multi-round case, this is a problem that I think Moshe and Bobby and someone else has studied. Yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, like the, the temporal aspect like really changes the scenario here. So speaking of repeated interactions, I just, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that at all. Like another theme in the session. Especially the commitment aspect. Yeah, so this, this did pop up with the paper with Bobby and Renato, uh, the issue of commitment and whether you can uh, escape in the middle of the mechanism or you have to stay till the end. Yeah, and Martin, you, you look at when you commit, the commitment player's utility increases, but it never, you can never increase the other player's utility by having commitment power, is that correct? Or did you not look at that question? 
not sure. I mean, there might be cases okay. where I mean, it depends on what they, I mean, the equilibrium is not unique, right? You might come up with examples where there are bad equilibria, which are bad for both of them. So, I mean, it's not as I mean, I know your bounds are for the, for the commitment player, but. Yeah, yeah, but it's not a zero sum game, right? So they might both profit by not getting stuck in a bad equilibrium. That's interesting. And in the in the filling information game, the revenue increases when you when you don't have to commit, or, uh, so or when, you, when you do have to commit. In the filling information game, I think that when there's interaction, you can extract the whole welfare. I think that this the and in our case, it's not possible to extract the whole uh, welfare. I see. I see. Wow. Well. Back to you know, yeah. interesting. Okay. I mean, I guess just a, a, a maybe a high level meta point on this on the, on that on that theme is that I think that um, you know in our community, like these sort of dynamic multi round games sometimes have a bit of a bad rap for you know solution concepts get very carry and it's really difficult to study and oftentimes you know we're there's there's a tendency to say, okay, we're going to take the, the models that people are studying in the static setting right now and move them into a dynamic setting and see what happens. And those, those static models are complicated already. Um, but I mean, I, I think some of this work, you know, like even extremely simple, like looks like almost trivial models in like a static case actually becomes very interesting, both technically and economically when you have multiple rounds. And, you know, to, as Jason was pointing out earlier, we have these concepts from computer sciences, like other solution concepts that aren't super hyper-rational that actually let us dig into what's happening in some of these um, multi-round dynamic settings, you know, like regret minimization and what have you. Um, and so I think there's like a rich ground now to sort of like take your favorite problem space, take a very simple version of it, look at a multi-round instance and like just see what pops out. Um, and so I think there's low hanging fruit in a lot of places here. I'm going to ask one more question uh, and then we can end if nobody else has any others uh, for sort of a fun question. And this is not the fun question I was planning on asking, but I told you, Redmond. Um, so these are all like, you know, very econ -y problems. And so I guess, why did you pick this aspect of econ to work on? And then what's your favorite CSE component of it? So a two-parter, why this aspect of econ for your problem? And then within the work, what's your favorite CSE component that makes it, you know, in ITCS? So all of you have to answer. <laughs> it's mandatory. You cannot leave the Zoom call unless you answer. I mean, okay. So I think in each, so there's, I think there's a comment. There's a comment. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer, I guess I have four questions to answer, but it's going to be sort of a common, common answer, which is that I think that, um, you know, there's this, there's this wonderful thing that, that computer science can bring to some of these economy questions, which is like this, you know, this notion of like looking at approximation. Right. And so like, um, I think that in a lot of cases we have these, environments where we we add just enough twists that actually characterizing what's what's like what's the optimal solution like what what's you know what's the information theoretically or you know mechanism design ish sort of optimal thing goes outside the realm of being sort of reasonable or practical or nice to specify um and i think that one thing that, that's really exciting for us as a community to be able to do is just sort of like take one step beyond that threshold and then be able to say things there because we bring in this toolkit of like, you know, we can't specify the optimal thing, but we can talk about robustness and approximation. Um, and I think in, in each of these two papers, sort of the CSE part that, that I think is coolest as a computer scientist is where we can say like, look, we show the complicated, the, the, the optimal thing is actually reasonably complicated, but like, hey, here's this like two approximation or whatever um, using sort of classic CSE tools. And we don't have to go, you know, it's, it's CSE stuff, but simple enough CSE stuff that you could, you know, you don't need to be a computer scientist to appreciate sort of what's going on there. There's economic insight as well. Um, so I love, I love doing things like that. Nice way to answer both at once. 
I mean, it's essentially an answer for everyone, I guess. So it's also an answer for me. I mean, it's uh, I mean, it, was, it sort of generates nice, interesting CS problems. I mean, this this paper, I mean, you have this graph structure, and there's sort of like constraints with faction problems arising in this in this thing, and it's, uh, it's never been studied before. I mean, similar things have been studied, but this kind is is, is sort of unique to this to this persuasion scenario and. I mean, it's just uh, it's nice that these these things pop up from from like economic scenarios that people have proposed in, in completely different directions. But then, when thinking about it algorithmically, there's like these interesting new problems popping up. That's what's fascinating. Hi, right, Gregory. It's you. Yeah, yeah, I also think that this is uh, the interesting thing that there are a lot of interesting problems that are difficult to analyze and uh, they seem to have applications and uh, in, these are things that uh, people from like different backgrounds care about, particularly economists. So it's nice to have something that's most challenging and has some uh, real, world, real world applications that can motivate it. Awesome. Any other questions? Any other arguments that you want to start? Jason? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> great, great session. An awesome uh, session sharing, yeah. Kira. Yeah, I really, I really love all of your papers, guys. I, I think they're all really phenomenal. Enjoyed your long talks as well. I really did watch them all in there. You guys make beautiful slides. Um, and it was lovely to see you all. So thanks. Thanks, Hope Kira. to see you on Gather later. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Kira. Great job. Bye.